The Ancient City, Book 3, Chapter 8, The Rituals and the Annals. The character and the virtue of the religion of the ancients was not to elevate human intelligence to the conception of the absolute, to open to the eager mind a brilliant road, at the end of which it could gain a glimpse of God. This religion was a badly connected assemblage of small creeds, of minute practices, of petty observances. It was not necessary to seek the meaning of them. There was no need of reflecting or of giving a reason for them. The word religion did not signify what it signifies for us. By this word, we understand a body of dogmas, a doctrine concerning God, a symbol of faith concerning what is in and around us. This same word among the ancients signified rites, ceremonies, acts of exterior worship. The doctrine was of small account. The practices were the important part. These were obligatory and bound man, ligare, religio. Religion was a material bond, a chain which held man a slave. Man had originated it, and he was governed by it. He stood in fear of it, and dared not reason upon it, or discuss it, or examine it. Gods, heroes, dead men, claimed a material worship from him, and he paid them the debt, to keep them friendly, and still more, not to make enemies of them. Man counted little upon their friendship. They were envious, irritable gods, without attachment or friendship for man, and willingly at war with him. Neither did the gods love man, nor did man love his gods. He believed in their existence, but would have wished that they did not exist. He feared even his domestic and national gods, and was continually in fear of being betrayed by them. His great inquietude was lest he might incur their displeasure. He was occupied all his life in appeasing them. Paces deorum querere, says the poet. But how satisfy them? Above all, how could one be sure that he had satisfied them, and that they were on his side? Men believed that the employment of certain formulas answered this purpose. A certain prayer composed of certain words had been followed by the success that was asked for. This was without doubt because it had been heard by the god, and had exercised an influence upon him, that it had been potent, more potent than the god, since he had not been able to resist it. They therefore preserved the mysterious and sacred words of this prayer. After the father, the son repeated it. As soon as writing was in use, it was committed to writing. Every family, every religious family at least, had a book in which were written the prayers of which the ancestors had made use, and with which the gods had complied. It was an arm which man employed against the inconstancy of the gods. But not a word or syllable must be changed, and least of all the rhythm in which it had been chanted. For then the prayer would have lost its force, and the gods would have remained free. But the formula was not enough. There were exterior acts whose details were minute and unchangeable. The slightest gesture of the one who performed the sacrifice, and the smallest parts of his costume, were governed by strict rules. In addressing one god, it was necessary to have the head veiled. In addressing another, the head was uncovered, for the third, the skirt of the toga was thrown over the shoulder. In certain acts, the feet had to be naked. There were certain prayers which were without effect unless the man, after pronouncing them, pirouetted on one foot from left to right. The nature of the victim, the color of the hair, the manner of slaying it, even the shape of the knife, and the kind of wood employed to roast the flesh, all was fixed for every god by the religion of each family, or of each city. In vain the most fervent heart offered to the gods the fattest victims. If one of the innumerable rites of the sacrifice was neglected, the sacrifice was without effect. The least failure made the sacred act an act of impiety. The slightest alteration disturbed and confused the religion of a country, and changed the protecting gods into so many cruel enemies. It was for this reason that Athens was so severe against the priest who made some change in the ancient rites. It was for the same reason that the Roman Senate degraded its consuls and its dictators who had committed any error in a sacrifice. All these formulas and practices had been handed down by ancestors who had proved their efficacy. There was no occasion for innovation. 
It was a duty to rest upon what the ancestors had done, and the highest piety consisted in imitating them. It mattered little that a belief changed. It might be freely modified from age to age, and take a thousand diverse forms, in accordance with the reflection of sages, or with the popular imagination. But it was of the greatest importance that the formulas should not fall into oblivion, and that the rites should not be modified. Every city, therefore, had a book in which these were preserved. The use of sacred books was universal among the Greeks, the Romans, and the Etruscans. Sometimes the ritual was written on tablets of wood, sometimes on cloth. Athens engraved its rites upon tablets of copper, that they might be imperishable. Rome had its books of the pontiffs, its books of the augurs, its book of ceremonies, and its collection of indigitamenta. There was not a city which had not also its collection of ancient hymns in honor of its gods. In vain did language change with manners and beliefs, the words and the rhythm remained unchangeable, and on the festivals men continued to sing these hymns after they no longer understood them. These books and songs written by the priests were preserved by them with the greatest care. They were never revealed to strangers. To reveal a rite or a formula would have been to betray the religion of the city and to deliver its gods to the enemy. For greater precaution they were concealed from the citizens themselves, and the priests alone were allowed to know them. In the minds of the people, all that was ancient was venerable and sacred. When a Roman wished to say that anything was dear to him, he said, That is ancient for me. The Greeks had the same expression. The cities clung strongly to their past, because they found in the past all the motives as well as all the rules of their religion. They had need to look back, for it was upon recollections and traditions that their entire worship rested. Thus, history had for the ancients a greater importance than it has for us. It existed a long time before Herodotus and Thucydides, written or unwritten. As simple oral traditions or in books, it was contemporary with the birth of cities. There was no city, however small and obscure it might be, that did not pay the greatest attention to preserving an account of what had passed within it. This was not vanity, but religion. A city did not believe it had the right to allow anything to be forgotten, for everything in its history was connected with its worship. History commenced indeed with the act of foundation, and recorded the sacred name of the founder. It was continued with the legend of the gods of the city its protecting heroes. It taught the date, the origin, and the reason of every worship, and explained its obscure rites. The prodigies which the gods of the country had performed, and by which they had manifested their power, their goodness, or their anger, were recorded there. There were described the ceremonies by which the priests had skillfully turned a bad presage, or had appeased the anger of the gods. There were recorded the epidemics which had afflicted the city, on what day a temple had been consecrated, and for what reason a sacrifice had been established. There were recorded all the events which related to religion, the victories that proved the assistance of the gods, and in which these gods had often been seen fighting, the defeats which indicated their anger, and for which it had been necessary to institute an expiatory sacrifice. All this was written for the instruction and the piety of the descendants. All this history was a material proof of the existence of the national gods, for the events which it contained were the visible form under which these gods had revealed themselves from age to age. Even among these facts there were many that gave rise to festivals and annual sacrifices. The history of the city told the citizen what he must believe and what he must adore. Then, too, this history was written by the priests. Rome had its annals of the pontiffs, the Sabine priests, the Samnite priests, and the Etruscan priests had similar ones. Among the Greeks there has been preserved to us the recollections of the books or secret annals of Athens, Sparta, Delphi, Naxos, and Tarentum. When Pausanias traveled in Greece in the time of Hadrian, the priests of every city related to him the old local histories. They did not invent them, but had learned them in their annals. This sort of history was entirely local. It commenced at the foundation, because what had happened before this date was of no interest to the city, and this explains why the ancients have so completely ignored their earliest history. Their records related only to affairs in which the city had been engaged, and gave no heed to the rest of the world. 
every city had its special history as it had its religion and its calendar. We can easily believe that these city annals were exceedingly dry and very whimsical, both in substance and in form. They were not a work of art, but a religious work. Later came the writers, the narrators, like Herodotus, the thinkers, like Thucydides. History then left the hands of the priests and became something quite different. Unfortunately, these beautiful and brilliant writings still leave us to regret the early annals of the cities, and all that they would have taught us of the beliefs and the inner life of the ancients. But these books, which appear to have been kept secret, which never left the sanctuaries, which were never copied, and which the priests alone read, have all perished, and only a faded recollection of them has remained. This trace, it is true, has a great value for us. Without it, we should perhaps have a right to reject all that Greece and Rome relate to us of their antiquities, all those accounts that appear to us so improbable, because they differ so much from our habits and our manner of thinking and acting, might pass for the product of men's imaginations. But this trace of the old annals that has remained shows us the pious respect which the ancients had for their history. Every city had archives in which the facts were religiously preserved as fast as they took place. In these sacred books, every page was contemporary with the event which it recorded. It was materially impossible to alter these documents, for the priests had the care of them, and it was greatly to the interest of religion that they should remain unalterable. It was not even easy for the pontiff, as he wrote the lines, skillfully to insert statements contrary to the truth, for he believed that all events came from the gods, that he revealed their will, and that he was giving future generations subjects for pious souvenirs and even for sacred acts. Every event that took place in the city commenced at once to form a part of the religion of the future. With such beliefs we can easily understand that there would be much involuntary error, a result of credulity or of a love of the marvelous and of faith in the national gods, but voluntary falsehood is not to be thought of, for that would have been impious. It would have violated the sanctity of the annals and corrupted the religion. We can believe, therefore, that in these books, if all was not true, there was nothing at least that the priests did not believe. Now, for the historian who seeks to pierce the obscurity of those early times, it is a great source of confidence to know that, if he has to deal with errors, he has not to deal with imposture. These errors, even, having still the advantage of being contemporary with those ancient ages that he is studying, may reveal to him, if not the details of events, at least the sincere convictions of men. These annals, it is true, were kept secret. Neither Herodotus nor Livy read them. But several passages of ancient authors prove that some parts became public, and that fragments of them came to the knowledge of historians. There were, moreover, besides the annals, these written and authentic documents, oral traditions, which were perpetuated among the people of a city, not vague and indifferent traditions like ours, but traditions dear to the cities, such as did not vary to please the imagination, such as men were not at liberty to modify, for they formed a part of the worship, and were composed of narrations and songs that were repeated from year to year in the religious festivals. These sacred and unchangeable hymns fixed the memory of events, and perpetually revived the traditions. Doubtless we should be wrong in believing that these traditions had the exactitude of the annals. The desire to praise the gods might be stronger than the love of truth. Still, they must have been at least a reflection of the annals, and must generally have been in accord with them, for the priests who drew up and who read the annals were the same who presided at the festivals where these old lays were sung. There came a time, too, when these annals were divulged, Rome finally published hers, those of other Italian cities were known, the priests of Greek cities no longer made any scruple of relating what theirs contained. Men studied and compiled from these authentic monuments. There was formed a school of learned men, from Varro and various Flaccus to Aulus Gellius and Macrobius. Light was thrown upon all ancient history. Some errors were corrected which had found their way into the traditions, and which the historians of the preceding period had repeated. Men learned, for example, that Porsena had taken Rome, and that gold had been paid to the Gauls. The age of historical criticism had begun, but it is worthy of remark that this criticism, which went back to the sources and studied the annals, found nothing there that authorized it to reject 
the historic whole which writers like Herodotus and Livy had constructed.